I think we've been pretty upfront that we're not just going to put an arbitrary innings limit on him. Taking as many steps as we can going forward and getting as much information as possible is obviously our best bet. Matt Blake, the New York Yankees pitching coach, joining us now. Matt, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate you taking the time um, ahead of another big game for this ball club. Let's ask first about Luis Hill. This uh, is a guy that maybe not a lot of people knew how impressive he was on the Hill outside of the organization, but my God, he's making himself known now. Are you surprised at the breakout type of season that he's having? Yeah, I don't know if surprise is the right word because I think we've always known he's had this in it, uh, in him, but you know, how quick it's come for him has definitely been impressive. You know, just making adjustments start to start and continue to refine his craft. Uh, it's definitely come quick for him this year. All right, Matt, listen, the reason I'm having you on is, first of all, you are, I, I respect how you, the one year we, we got to work together, how you go about your business. But I want to talk about your journey to getting to the big leagues because – then we're going to hit on the rest of the pitchers and what you and Harkey and the rest of the Yankees organization have built up. So you just take us your journey getting to the big leagues and how just just how it all built up, because if people don't know it, they're in for about a three minute story here that is unusual. Yeah. But you have handled yourself like an absolute pro in the big leagues. Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, well, you know, I played college baseball. You know, obviously the writing was on the wall that I was not going to be a, a professional baseball player. So I kind of got to my craft of coaching earlier than most. Um, but basically started coaching uh, a rec team with my dad and then started doing some private lessons and private lessons started going well and started building it up and joined up with uh, Eric Cressy of Cressy Performance down in Massachusetts. Uh, we kind of built uh, kind of like a pitching center there that was kind of holistic in nature with strength training and throwing and some rehab. So we were kind of a little bit ahead of the curve there, um, coaching some high school baseball and whatnot around that time. And then uh, the Cleveland Guardians and Indians at the time picked me up to be a coordinator. So I came in as a, a minor league coordinator for a year and then uh, jumped into the front office for three years overseeing the, the minor league pitching department before being called over from uh, cash and uh, after 19 to come fill in uh, with the Yankees. Yeah. And then, but you got, I mean, you didn't just like, you, you kind of really glazed over that a little bit. Like <laughs> you came in to a big league team that yeah. we were looking to win the world series. Like, yeah, it brought me over and that was cool. You became the big league pitching coach. Like, the, that, that is like not – you were a trailblazer because other guys have done it. But I also saw other coaches come in with no big league experience to different teams and not handle it the way that you did. Not, comm not command the respect, but earn the respect that I see guys give you that have big league time, that are big league veterans – how do you build that? How do you build those relationships? I yeah, appreciate that. Um, well, that was one of them when Cash first called over with the, the Indians and Chris Antonetti came to get me to say that he had called to interview me for the major league pitching coach. I was like, you sure they got the right guy here? I was like, you know, they're just coming off an ALCS and 103 wins. And it's like, we're not just looking to just throw someone into the fire that's got no experience. But, you know, when Cash called, he's kind of said all the right things about, you know, maybe what my skill set was. They were looking to integrate, you know, the data, pull more people in, uh, be a little more holistic and collaborative with some of the different departments. Um, so that was obviously my strength with Cleveland. Um, and then coming over. And I think the biggest thing is just not pretending like you have experience. So, you know, when we meet with Garrett Cole and, you know, his interview to see if you want to sign with us and he asks, you know, how many mound visits have you done? And I say zero, you know, I'm not lying. I'm not going to try and pretend like I've done any. So, you know, that's not my strength at the time, but, you know, partnering with the players and making sure they understand that I, you know, I've got their best interest in mind and I'm going to do everything I can to find the resources needed to, to put them in the best spot to succeed when they go out there. I think that's the biggest thing. Matt, you were with Kratz in that 2020 spring training, also with uh, Chris Iannetta, my husband. So let's uh, don't don't lie. Don't don't think for one second that Kratz was second in line behind uh, Higgy. Right. I mean, let's be honest about that. You knew it was Iannetta the whole time. Right. Let, let, be yeah. honest about that. I appreciated Chris's time with us, and I was hoping to stay longer and push Kratz out, but that's all right. It's okay. That's how, that's how I survived. That's how I survived, Matt. Just hanging around. Everybody knew that Chris was better than me. 
It's just a matter of, did Chris want to go to the alt site? No, nope. he did not. <laughs> he wanted to be home. And I just wanted to continue to like steal money. Hang there you go. And steal money. There you go. I, I tell you what, Matt, what you guys are doing has been so impressive. Obviously, the best record uh, in all of baseball, certainly the best team in the American League. And oh, by the way, you don't even have Garrett Cole back yet, who, whose return is imminent. How do you think that's just going to infuse even more uh, positivity? I know he's been around the club. I know he's kind of been coaching oh. himself, um, you know, and, and talking to the guys, but it can only get better from here, right? Yeah, that's the hope. Um, he's obviously doing a nice job in the rehab process. Um, you know, filling in as part-time pitching coach, part-time pitcher. So, you know, we'll have to take some of the responsibilities off his plate on the coaching side when we get him back here. But uh, no, he's he's tremendous. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, one of the best pitchers, if not the best pitcher in the league, uh, you know, last year winning the Cy Young and then coming back this year, um, looking for him to kind of fill in and give us solid innings. I mean, that's what we've been doing this whole season. And obviously he's, uh, you know, obviously a step up going forward. Matt. We are going, we're going to be real now, okay? Because this is this is what this show brings. How annoying is Garrett on days he doesn't pitch when he's like, hey, Matt, you know what he should probably do right here? He should probably get a, he should probably throw a slider. That's what I would do. And you're like, ugh. Or have you been able to like, hey, Garrett, like pump the brakes. Like we'll take care of Luis. You take care of Garrett. He's got to find the right filter. Obviously, he's we're all getting better at our craft every day, and he's gotten you know a lot better at understanding where the avenues are to get in certain players. Um, and he offers a lot, so you know I'm never going to turn him away. But it's always a skill of coaching is knowing when to bring information to the player, and I think you know we're always working to get better at that. All of us. Yes. Yes. That was a very PC way of telling him, saying, I really can't make Garrett Cole shut up. That's that's really a, a, a positive. It's tough uh, to do. <laughs> it's tough to do. I'll say it. I'll say it so Matt doesn't get in trouble because I know he's watching. He's like, hey, Matt, have you watched my have you watched my rehab assignments? They were really good. The curveball wasn't quite feeling the best, but I know the fastball's there and it really feels good. <laughs> I, know, I know where my limitations are. So, I, you know, take it what I can get from Garrett. Garrett Cole made his debut six years ago today. How has his career developed? How do you think he's gotten better over the course of, of his uh, his time, Matt? Yeah, I think obviously he had the big jump when he went to Houston and learned how to use the four-seam fastball, and that kind of changed kind of the, the arc of his career a little bit. And then, you know, the league's kind of evolved to this point where there's a lot more information out there about, you know, how guys are pitching, you know, maybe how to handle the four-seam fastball up, you know, that's not as unique as it was at that time. So, you know, he's a student of the game and he continues to evolve his craft and, you know, learn how to use different pitches. And you know, obviously he's not going to be, you know, the power pitcher of 97 to 100 for the rest of his career. So, you know, learning how to incorporate the cutter, learning how to use the curveball more and things he's always done, but just, you know, continuing to read what the league's doing with him and, you know, adjust his craft. And I think that's the biggest thing is he's just, he's so dialed into the details that, you know, he continues to evolve, um, you know, trying to stay one step ahead. FT is headed to the MLB All-Star game this year. And there's only one way you should be finding tickets for any ball game. SeatGeek is the official ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, so they have you covered for all of your baseball ticket needs. I'm super pumped to hit the Futures game this year. That new skills competition looks electric. I agree, Kratz. It's like the Olympics for baseball. Cannot wait to see that. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. Baseball season's in full swing, and you don't want to miss out. SeatGeek has your tickets to every game and, of course, concerts, festivals, and more. Every ticket's backed by their buyer guarantee, and SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. And Kratz, you know FT came through for the people. Use our code FOUL for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's 20 bucks off your first purchase with promo code F-O-U-L. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app, please. So you're working with Cressy. Cressy's one of the you know, national, world-renowned baseball players trainers you know getting guys in situations he actually he's working for working for the yankees too you know he was on here talking about that stuff hit on a little bit because you were creating pitchers who throw a billion miles an hour and it's really created what this game is but it's also created an absolute epidemic of yeah. injuries to pitchers how do you because you've seen the mechanical side of it you've seen the execution side of it now in the big leagues but you've also seen the side of it that, hey, we're going to teach you to throw really hard. How do you how do you blend and balance that like we could be breaking you? 
Is this worth it? Yeah, it's obviously a challenge at the major league level because by the time they get to us, there's a lot of established patterns of kind of how they operate and, you know, some of the, the shapes they create with their delivery are what are making them successful, but also put them at risk for, you know, injury. So you're always towing the line of performance versus health, you know, when you're at our level. And I think, you know, it really is a grassroots level effort to, to really understand what guys are doing with their bodies in terms of a year round program, how much they're throwing off the mound, how much they're throwing in general, how much downtime they're they need or don't need um you know all these things come into play and obviously you know when we're at the major league level and you got to play 162 games and you know not a lot of off days there's a lot of you know stress on the body that we're you know just trying to accommodate and you know perform at a high level so it's not an easy balance for sure what is the one thing that you you look for you know you came like you said your resume speaks for itself coming from from never playing, never being there. But when you get to the big league level and you're in the Yankees, Brian Cashman says, Hey, we're thinking about signing Marcus Stroman. What's the one thing? Cause I, every pitching coach I played for, they always had like the one thing they were like, all right, I don't like this or I like this. I'm looking for this in their motion. What's your one thing that you look for and you say, Hey, Brian, I like this guy. We can fix him." Yeah. I think it's always like, do they have a, you know, an, outlier skill that we can lean on you know obviously stroman is an accomplished pitcher at this level he's done it for a long time he knows his craft he's you know a student of the game he understands his body i think he's as good as anyone at making adjustments and uh i think with him it was you know obviously leaning into what's he been doing with the sinker how do we incorporate the slider a little bit more um obviously he's continuing to evolve his craft but I think it's just what's the pitcher's strength and how do we build on it? And it's not one recipe. It's not one, you know, way to do it. There's so many different guys out there that are doing it with, you know, whether it's power four seamers or, you know, elite sinkers, or they can really spin the ball and just making sure we identify what these guys do well and lean into that. A couple of years ago, Clay Holmes had a five ERA essentially with the Pirates. He's one of the best relievers in baseball in a Yankee uniform. What's been the biggest difference for him, Matt, in the last couple of years to make him such an elite bullpen guy? Yeah, I mean, when we got him, it was, you know, leaning into the sinker and making him realize how good that pitch was and how much room for error he had with it. Um, And then obviously there's some buy-in and some confidence building with getting the results when you do throw it over the plate more. And um, he had a really strong start with us, you know, getting the sinker over the plate and kind of refining what his visuals were with that pitch. And then, you know, the league adjusts to him and starts to attack the sinker a little bit more. And then he develops the slider, um, both the sweeper and the shorter um, kind of gyro slider. And I think it just gives him a couple different weapons. And, you know, another guy that continues to stay one step ahead of the league in terms of trying to adjust before they adjust to him. All right, so you're fifth in strikeouts as a team. So you're like, oh, that's great. Strikeouts are the best. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned that the bullpen's not striking out enough batters? Being 22nd in bullpen strikeouts in the league compared to everyone else in the league? Or is that something that you guys built that way? Because you have a guy like Clay Holmes who still gets strikeouts. But Mm -hmm. it's not that elite level everybody throws, you know, a billion at the top of the zone for strikeouts. Is that something that was kind of built that way? And, or was it just something that's happened and you're looking to improve that? Yeah, I think it's kind of evolved over the last few years. Obviously we got some kind of contact management pitchers in the bullpen over the last few years that have had a lot of success. And I think, you know, somewhat of a market inefficiency, we were able to grab a lot of these guys without a lot of cost involved, whether it's through trades or signings. Um, and we kind of ended up with a, you know, heavy sinker slider bullpen that does generate a lot of ground balls and weak contact. Um, in a vacuum, you'd love to strike a lot of guys out late in the game and take some of the chance out of it. Um, outside of that, you know, I don't know if I'm necessarily concerned. Obviously, you'd like to strike more guys out, but as long as we don't walk guys and we put guys on the ground at a, you know, or put them in the air weekly, you know, I think we can still navigate a lot of these high leverage situations. But um, And there are some opportunities for the guys that we currently have to strike guys out at a higher rate. So I think attacking you know, some, some hitters differently will go a long way going forward. But um, it's definitely something we're aware of. Um, I wouldn't say we're overly concerned, but know that we could rebalance going forward as well. Matt, I've asked a lot of people this, but it's all been speculation. What a better opportunity to, than to ask the Yankees pitching coach himself. When Garrett does come back, do you protect Heel as far as innings? Do you, Where do you go with this? I doubt very seriously a six-man rotation, but from mm-hmm. what your starters have done, it's hard to move anybody out. Where, where do you guys go with this? 
Yeah, those are obviously the, the tough conversations you hope to have um, when you have too many good starters. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, we're going to have to seriously look at as we go forward here. You know, what's the realistic, you know, innings total that we can expect out of some of these guys? Obviously, Luis Hill, first and foremost, just hasn't had a lot track record of innings over the last few years. So we got to be really mindful of, you know, his workload as we go. I think we've been pretty upfront that we're not just going to put a, you know, arbitrary innings limit on him, more so kind of look at, you know, how he's responding to the workload he's currently managing, how his work looks like in between, you know, what his recovery looks like in the weight room and training room, you know, how his metrics are tracking as we go. You know, all those things are important to give us maybe a more informed decision on him. Um, and then just try and find the, the best balance for the group, you know, is it in the bullpen? You know, is it a timeout at some point? You know, I don't know if we have those answers, um, but I think, you know, taking as many steps as we can going forward and getting as much information as possible is obviously, you know, our best bet. Did you just say you're going to put Luis Hill in timeout with a tattoo on his esophagus? There's you can't no put time. somebody in timeout. He's going to put you in timeout, okay? You can't be putting people in timeout, okay? Yeah. But yeah, that what it – you're you're in on you're in on these conversations. Last week, I said on this show, I was told by a team doctor, big league team doctor, that there technically is no innings limit. That it was something that was created by an agent that didn't want his player to go past a certain amount and didn't pitch him in the. They didn't end up pitching him in the playoffs. Do you guys have a limit as a team? Are you like okay? He only threw X amount last year as a college junior, so he can't go past this in the minor leagues, or he did this in the minor leagues. He can't go past this, like Luis Heel, who's coming off an injury. He can't. Do you have an actual innings limit? No, I mean, obviously, you've got the you know general rule of thumb of you know the twenty five percent incremental growth on the, the innings, but. You know, for me, it's it's just so arbitrary of like, how did we get to these innings? Were they, you know, how many pitches were you thrown? How many high stress pitches? You know, how many times on five days versus six days? Um, you know, all those things are important to look at. I think, you know, how is the guy responding from these outings? It's just there's a lot of other pieces of the puzzle that go into it without saying, you know, 125 or 150 is the right number. Because um, I just, you know, we really don't know. You know, we're just guessing. So why would you put a limit on it if, if we don't have the exact answer? Yeah. I have one question for you, Matt, that has nothing to do with pitching, but you're around this team every single day. And, and the Yankees are better when Juan Soto's in the lineup. How has he just energized this club and obviously made you guys a bit more multidimensional? It doesn't just fall on Aaron Judge uh, as it did last year for some of it. Um, how has he just changed the complexity of things for the opposing pitcher? And, and how has he made you guys better? I mean, obviously, he's you know a professional hitter up there. His, his uh, bats have some weight to him. He a really disciplined hitter and I think it, you know that kind of bleeds into the rest of the group and I think everybody's comfortable passing the baton from one to the next when he's in the lineup and knowing that no one person shoulders the whole load like you know in the past where Judgey might have felt that pressure um, I think it's spread out evenly amongst the group and obviously adding Verdugo into this mix has been huge I just think you know the balance of the lineup's been really strong to this point and you know everybody's been able to you know hold the, their part. What does Harkey mean? to you and your development in the big leagues here, the bullpen coach being there for you the entire time. What does, what does that mean? And what is that relationship with you and him? Like, uh, he's been huge. I mean, that was one of the first things when I signed on that I knew we needed to keep Hark just because, you know, he's been around the Yankees for so long. He's been here since uh, 2008, really, um, and then had time with Arizona for a little bit. But, you know, knows the AL East, knows New York, knows all the players, you know, understands what the dynamic is in New York. Um, he's a tie to the, the other guys, you know, Andy and Mo and those guys. So I think, you know, just having the respect of all those guys and keeping him as, you know, a confidant in the bullpen and, you know, the trust is is huge between the both of us. I mean, he's helped shepherd me along and not doing stupid things in the dugout. So, you know, I think that he's been, you know, huge for my growth, you know, as a pitching coach. Wait, one, right, one more thing along ahead. here. Go one ahead, more, yeah. one more thing. Yeah. Sorry. What what is what is one stupid thing he told you not to do? Because <laughs> when, when you get when you get like what people don't know is when you go from a minor league coordinator to just a big league pitching coach, like you've never been in a big league clubhouse in the sense of like little things like paying dues, you ride yeah. on charter flights, you pack your bags somewhat. So what was the dumbest thing that Harkey was like, Matt? 
don't <laughs> don't do that. I don't know if uh, there's any one thing that stands out. I know Booney and uh, Phil Nevin used to wear me out in the dugout like, man, this guy is first timer in here, you know. So, yep. you know, the one thing that Booney still gets on me for is when a, a batter hits a foul ball down the line and I'm like a fan just looking to see if it's going to be fair or foul. And <laughs> watch the hitter. He's going to tell you, you know, so <laughs> like, maybe after 20 years in the dugout, I'll figure it out. Yeah, that's all right. You're still a kid at heart. Better to be a fan than not. Matt yeah. Blake, we appreciate your time. You guys are doing tremendous. You got Marcus Stroman on the hill tonight going up against Singer. Enjoy uh, enjoy Kansas City and uh, best of luck and, and continued success to you. Thanks for being with us on, on Foul Territory. We appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy baseball the way it should be covered.